Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Misty Bennett. And I'm Rob Olson. Um, so you might notice, first of all, that uh, it's not actually two guys this time. Um, we have a, we've a we replaced Livius, at least for this episode, uh, maybe for more, with a um, longtime co-host on the, on, the, on the podcast, Misty Bennett. So Misty, thanks for, for sitting in for Livius, who is not available this week. I am excited to be here, especially after last week. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's like Misty Month because um, you joined us for the holiday episode, the, the, the Halloween episode. You're doing this, and then um, we're actually next week going to be posting an interview with one of the authors of the book that we're talking about this week, um, which is The Killer's Shadow, The FBI's Hunt for a White Supremacist Serial Killer, in parentheses, Cases of the FBI's Original Manhunter, close parentheses, um, by John Douglas and Mark Olshaker. So um, the the thing that's interesting or unique about this book review, besides the fact that Misty is, is co-hosting with me, is that it is a nonfiction book. And this is the first time since episode six, I believe, of the podcast where we uh, were discussing a nonfiction book. Um, and I don't have a ton of experience reading nonfiction, but I believe you have a little bit more, right? Yes, I have read especially true crime nonfiction. So, perfect. That was one of the reasons that, like, I thought it would be nice to have have you join, is because you have at least some sort of. Um, I guess we can maybe get into it a little bit. So, like, my experience with reading true crime is really limited to. I read um, Helter Skelter. Very nice. Um, by Vincent Bugliosi. And then I also read his book, Outrage, which is about the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, and I believe that's all. So, like, you, you, you've you gone a little bit further. Yes. Um, I think back when I was younger, the first one I read was The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule, which is a pretty famous book about her relationship with Ted Bundy. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I've read several about the big uh, big serial killers, uh, but also Michelle McNamara's um, recent book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, and a couple other ones of Johnny Douglas, including Mindhunter, uh, which Mark Olshocker also did. And then um, he mentions, I think it's Robert Ressler in uh, The Killer's Shadow, um, someone that he worked with at the FBI, and uh, read his book, uh, those who, For Those Who Hunt Monsters something to that effect. So yes, been uh, heavily involved in true crime for, for years now. It's a, it's a favorite of mine. And then obviously outside of books, probably like um, movies or TV shows and podcasts as well. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I had, um, I, uh, is it ID? The ID channel has a lot of true crime shows <laughs> and I had some on in the background when I was doing laundry today. So it's uh it's just part of the background noise of my life true crime <laughs> <laughs> that's that's going to be helpful because um especially because the majority of the books that i read are fiction um having someone with a perspective of other similar types of you know true crime books is going to or true crime i guess content in general is going to be helpful for perspective because i've seen seen or listened to seen listen or read to so few little that um um, I don't have much to compare it against, but I guess um, since we've done a little setup of our expo uh, our experience with true crime in general, we could probably talk get started talking about the book. So um, I forgot what we decided. Are you reading the, the description? I will read the synopsis. Awesome. Yep, sure thing. All right. The Killer's Shadow, the legendary FBI criminal profiler and international best-selling author of Mindhunter and the killer across the table returns with this timely, relevant book that goes to the heart of extremism and domestic terrorism, examining in depth his chilling pursuit of an eventual prison confrontation with Joseph Paul Franklin, a white nationalist serial killer and one of the most disturbing psychopaths he has ever encountered. Worshippers stream out of a Midwestern synagogue after Sabbath services unaware that only hundreds of yards away, an expert marksman, an avowed racist, anti-Semite, and member of the Ku Klux Klan patiently awaits his hunting rifle at the ready. The October 8, 1977 shooting 
was a forerunner to the tragedies and divisiveness that plague us today. John Douglas, the FBI's pioneering first full-time criminal profiler, hunted the shooter, a white supremacist named Joseph Paul Franklin, whose Nazi-inspired beliefs propelled a three-year reign of terror across the United States, targeting African Americans, Jews, and interracial couples. In addition, Franklin bombed the home of Jewish leader Morris Amade, shot and paralyzed Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint, and seriously wounded civil rights leader Vernon Jordan. The fugitive supported his murderous spree, robbing banks in five states, from Georgia to Ohio. Douglas and his writing por partner, Mark Olshacker, returned to this disturbing case with re uh, that reached the highest levels of the Bureau, which was fearful Franklin would become a presidential assassin and haunted him for years to come as the threat of copycat domestic terrorist killers increasingly became a reality. Detailing the dogged pursuit of Franklin that employed profiling, psychology, and meticulous detective work, Douglas and Olshocker relate how the case was a make or break test for skill experimental behavioral science unit and revealed a new type of determined, mission-driven serial killer whose only motivation was hate. A riveting, excuse me, a riveting cautionary tale rooted in history that continues to echo today, the killer's shadow is a terrifying and essential exploration of the criminal personality and the vile grip of extremism and what happens when rage-filled speech evolves into deadly action and the hatred of the other is allowed full reign. It's a pretty good synopsis. <laughs> That's so much. Um, I have to applaud you for doing such a great job of reading that because it's it's tons of stuff. But yeah, it, it really illustrates um, uh, like obviously the high points of what we're going to be talking about. Um, not the most lighthearted of subject matter, I'm going to point out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> so, all right. Before we start talking about the book, I'll just do the author bios really quick. Misty did the heavy lifting with that massive um, synopsis. But here's the bios for both of the authors. John Douglas, the legendary FBI criminal profiler and veteran author of true crime books, has spent over 25 years researching and calling the stories of America's most disturbing criminals. A veteran of the United States Air Force, he has directly worked and or had overall supervision in over 5,000 violent crime cases over the past 48 years. He's currently a chairman of the board of the Cold Case Foundation, one of the foremost experts and investigators of criminal minds and motivations. He currently lives in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, all right. Mark Olshaker is an Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker and author of 10 nonfiction books and five novels, including Einstein's Brain and The Edge. His books with former FBI special agent and criminal profiling pioneer John Douglas, beginning with Mindhunter and most recently Law and Disorder, obviously this bio is a little out of date, have mm -hmm. sold millions of copies and have been translated into many languages. Mindhunter is now a dramatic series on Netflix directed by David Fincher. He, he and his wife, Carolyn, an attorney, live in Washington, D.C. Um, and the news just hit recently that um, there's no intention of going to a third season of the show Mindhunter, which uh, I wasn't super excited about. No, another heartbreak from Netflix. Bank. <laughs> but like, <laughs> um, and, and obviously we'll start talking about the book, but it's, because the series is the topic right now, um, it, it, was, it came down to basically Fincher saying like it was too exhausting to, to make the series for the small number of people that were watching it, more or less. I feel like he has a lot of reasons to not do projects, and I'll <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> Either way, I'm a little sad because like they had that beautiful slow burn of like BTK. BTK, absolutely. It was. Um, I mean, it, it's just a great show. Yeah, really was a, was very well done. Uh, the acting was well done, and uh, Fincher is typically on his game, but um, for some reason. Here's what I'm saying. Hand it off to Charlize Theron. <laughs> Let her just carry the ball, you know, and, and keep it going. He doesn't, he can just, he can sit back and just leave his name on it or whatever. Yeah, 
Agreed. Agreed. You know, like he does with <laughs> other things. Utopia. Um, he backed out of as well. But anyway, um, this is just my bitterness about not getting to have the rest of the BTK story, especially. That's, yeah, I know. That, that's what I was really excited about. Um, but, you know, we can always rewatch what we have, which is like, mm-hmm. that's like the the fate of, of a fan um, a fan of a cancellation. So, like, I can't tell you how many times either of us have watched Hannibal for that exact Hannibal. reason because there's just nothing else. There's no more, and there won't be more until there is. Yep. Nothing compares. Nothing. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> all right. So, before we start talking about the book, I will say that um, because this is a nonfiction story, uh, we probably won't go with the, the typical um, naming of characters and explaining the plot in a, in a, in a direct kind of uh, sequential way that we usually do. Um, obviously there is a timeline to things that happen, but we might just jump around more than we would with uh with a fiction story. And then obviously spoilers are a li- little bit different too, because this is all fact. So there's nothing that we really have to worry about spoiling. So um, just the explanation of the book might be a little bit different than we usually do on the podcast. Right. That being said, the book starts out with a prologue uh, that is described a little bit in the synopsis about the uh, the synagogue, uh, people leaving the synagogue after, I think it was a bat mitzvah. Bat mitzvah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's very detailed in, in talking about how there was a sniper who was set up nearby and going into detail even about how like nails were nailed into nearby trees and a sock hanging and that was going to be the mount for the rifle that they were using and stuff um just very meticulously detailed explanation of how this sniper was going to was prepared to shoot up this bat mitzvah um where basically there wasn't a specific target it was just once these people come out of the synagogue I'm fucking shit up. And that's that's the prologue that starts the book. Um, uh, so, and I'd say that it's a pretty nice way of, of establishing the tone because, like, there is a lot of, like, like procedural information about the crimes that, that are discussed. But also, like, it's not, they're not intimate crimes. Right, yeah. And so, like, the fact that he was just shooting whoever happened to be there at the beginning in this prologue, I think, was was a good way to start it out as well. Yes, absolutely. Kind of establishing the kind of the victimology and the MO all at the at the beginning in the prologue, which is something different than a lot of the serial killers that we we typically hear about, um, like the Ted Bundys or the Jeffrey Dahmers or even, you know, we've talked about BTK. So um, it definitely kind of uh, or definitely sets up a different type than we discuss most often. Yeah. And then also, like, I think that when we're introduced to criminals, traditionally, um, it's very much like a first crime, second crime, third crime kind of situation, as opposed to like, this is this particular crime didn't wasn't like the beginning of this person's spree of killing. It was kind of somewhere in the middle or toward the end. And it just happens to typify like it, it's the one that represents like pretty much all the nastiness, I think. Uh, yeah, certainly. I always blank on like where where does it go from there? Then it's just like. An <laughs> inter- um, well, okay, so I think from there he does a really good job of setting up the cultural time period, um, and not just of um, like the society culture, but also practices of law enforcement and where mm-hmm. they were as a unit because they get asked to profile this um the sniper that's been going around and they've at least connected the fact that there is someone who is killing people based on race whether they were jewish or african-american yeah so the context i have of john douglas uh in general as the investigator is just the tv show mindhunter um i haven't read any of his other books before and so Mm -hmm. Uh, the way this book plays out, like obviously there's references to stuff that happened throughout the timeline of that show. And, um, and so I'm, I'm reading things in this book and thinking, Oh, that's where he's at in his career. And then obviously seeing the people who are acting out the show, but um, yeah, Yeah. the, one of the things about profiling um, um, this dude is 
that it was uh, Joseph Paul Franklin pro- profiling Joseph Paul Franklin is that um, once it proves to be an effective profile that was a helpful and be accurate, like that helped legitimize their practice of, of criminal profiling. So um, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but like I said, we're probably going to jump around a little, um, but it was cool to see that, um, you know, what's alluded to um, in the TV show where we're seeing like the actual like tentpole moments that, that helped yeah. to solidify the practice and, and also seeing the stakes of this is a very experimental um, type okay. of thing at the time. And they didn't know if it was going to work. And there's all of that, like, office politics stuff. And so any win they got was was helping them legitimize their their thing. Absolutely. No, and I think that's not even jumping around because I think that's part of the timeline that's so interesting about uh, Douglas writing this story is it's not just the story of uh, Franklin, but it's also kind of the story of... Uh, behavioral science and and criminal profiling. Mm -hmm. So, and it absolutely does talk about that. He even references Mindhunter in the book, which is really exciting for anyone who has seen the show, or maybe (laughs) it will encourage people um, to check the show out because I think we take for granted where we are now when it comes to detective work or um, any kind of, you know, show that you watch on TV that's... uh, (laughs) A Murdy, uh, excuse me, Murdy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, murder, police, procedural drama, those types of shows where <laughs> it just, it's almost like magic happens when a detective comes in, he reads mm-hmm. a crime scene, and all of a sudden we have this amazing profile. Um, it wasn't quite that simple. And this gives credit to the investigators who had to prove that their methods. Uh, were worth spending time in, they were worth uh, bringing out as uh, consultants, and that um, it ultimately helped law enforcement be better at their jobs. Um, and he takes he takes uh, moments to also appreciate that it takes the uh, dogged investigative work, like people writing down license plates and researching those, looking at tracking down just small, minute details that's what really gets you to finding the culprit. It's not just being able to psychologically profile the type of personality. So I thought they did a really good job of, of really um, capturing what it takes. Oh, I 100% agree. And and yes, so, and, and imagine like, so in a modern day where the, you know, science has advanced like DNA stuff mm-hmm. and all types of different like, you know, you have a fleck of paint from a car accident and like you have a database <laughs> where you can look at every car paint that's ever existed, like all those kinds of things didn't exist when. So like the 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 um, killing that was referenced at the beginning was a year, like a year to the day before I was born. And so like we're talking in a time where technology is in the future, like it's not it's not even mm-hmm. part of investigative processes yet. And so it's all like you're saying it's boots on the ground and it's like, um, you know, uh, considering the fact like the synopsis said that, that this is a, cr- a, a crime spree that takes place over. And I don't know if spree is the right word, but that's what I'm using. Um, <laughs> takes place over like multiple states and like the way that police, you know, um, precincts and stuff wouldn't necessarily know to cooperate with each other. Right. Like the odds against anybody <laughs> figuring shit out over 40 years ago, I can't even imagine what it is compared to today. <laughs> exactly. No, that's exactly right. And even though, so that is something that's talked about in a lot of uh, true crime on uh, documentaries, shows, podcasts, and other books that one of the biggest obstacles um, over the last few decades has been getting departments to to work together and i think he even makes um not a joke necessarily but kind of a or mentions a saying amongst law enforcement or maybe the fbi that um the easiest way to confuse law enforcement or to prevent them from um connecting two crimes is to drag the body over state lines yeah. Yeah. so that's how simple it was because they just didn't 
think about a killer being mobile. And so um, some, that's what made Franklin, again, such a dangerous killer is he did travel all over the United States. Yeah. And effectively, like knowing what to do to to get around and like change identities and, and stuff like that. Yes. So the one thing I want to mention, and I have a, I have a quote that I'm going to read. Um, that is another side to um, like him in the beginning of the book, talking about the investigative process. Uh, first of all, I'm going to do the joke then I'm going to do the serious thing. One of the things this is very beginning. I think it's the first, it is the first chapter he says about the profile of Franklin is, uh, I had I had observed that orderly compulsive people tended to drive darker cars, and I was like, oh shit, me and Missy are in trouble. <laughs> True story. Uh, so uh, I think I've only ever owned black cars, so that must mean I'm orderly and compulsive. Yeah, um, I've had. Oh no, I've had. A, I was gonna say blue and black, but I also had a red car. So, but my last two definitely black so and i have no intentions of changing so yeah. definitely i would be easily profiled he's gonna profile the shit out of us um <laughs> another thing about uh you mentioned earlier how the portrayals of of people in tv popular tv and popular crime stuff in general make it seem like there's like magic going on and um and so this quote i thought was really good and it was something they hadn't thought about before um, but it's, it's a, it's a nice perspective on, um, how people break down in their minds, like the crimes and the criminals. And then uh, obviously like, this is more about the victims. <clears throat> so many of the fictional portrayals of FBI profilers that have come along over the years, talk about the importance of being able to put oneself in the mind of the criminal, which we certainly had to be able to do, but being able to put oneself in the mind and shoes of the victim is equally important. It not only helps us contextualize the entire physical and psychological psychosocial environment of the crime, how the victim's reaction affected the offender's attitude, behavior, and actions as the crime unfolded, but also gave us even more motivation to work for the victim who could no longer speak for her or himself. Mm-hmm. Huge. I'd never even thought about that before, but absolutely yeah. it makes sense to like, understand the victim as much as the criminal absolutely and uh i'm gonna segue that into what one of the things that frightens me the most about someone like franklin is his victims it was absolutely just about race and what is more scary than that that something completely out of your control the color of your skin or being jewish um was a reason for him to kill you that's it yeah, or dating someone with a different or dating, skin color. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's where like it, it was interesting to read as we go on. Like later in the book, we'll probably talk about like the impact of of this type of killer on on his thought process for for profiling people. But yeah, like it makes it especially scary that you're reduced to something as simple as like like you were saying something that's out of control, like like skin color. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically like, so, um, the book plays out where it, it, it lays out a series of similar crimes where Mm -hmm. it's, um, people being like the victims are basically either mixed race couples or, um, African American people out doing whatever they're doing and a sniper attacks them, uh, kills them. Why did I say attack? Like, like we don't know the (laughs) outcome. A sniper yeah. kills them. Let's make let's make it as like obvious. Like, and that's that's some bullshit in the news lately. Say it, say it what it is. <laughs> oh, like, absolutely. Where they're like, you know, like if a you know if someone, <sighs> you you get what I'm saying. Where they'll be like, oh, so and so did this thing, and it's like, let's call it what it is. It was an execution, and that's what yeah. this was. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do the news dancing around words and shit. So like, basically, a sniper kills. Um, there's a series of of you know situations where a sniper kills like we talked about either african-american people or people who are in mixed race couples um or in the 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 jewish um there's only the the synagogue and i think maybe one other no or is it just the synagogue i think there were a couple yeah um so it details those crimes as the book goes along but then also talks about 
um, like law enforcement's uh, attempts to figure out what's going on. And then also obviously the FBI um, working toward confirming that they're linked and how it, how it goes to the apprehension of, of Franklin, who is obviously the, the focus of the book. Right. And euphemism was the word that I was really hoping to figure out before now about the way that the news <laughs> describes things. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. It's like, call it what yeah. it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then eventually, uh, because he does, he lays out the crimes um, after kind of setting the stage and, uh, and discussing where profiling was at that time and how important this specific case was at the time that it occurred in the early stages of that behavioral science unit. Um, and then they catch a break because he uh, eventually, uh, serial killers uh, that we know of, they kind of break down um, and become a little more vulnerable, which is exactly what happened to Franklin um, at a certain point, and they managed to capture him giving plasma at a blood bank. <laughs> yeah, and then and and that points back to the um, like the boots on the ground investigative work because um, essentially the idea was like um, if the thought the thought from the profiling perspective was that if this person was on the run, he was going to act more. Um, erratically or spur of the mm-hmm. moment or not as thoughtfully and carefully, and he was going to make a mistake. Um, yeah. The other thing about the profile was, um, uh, and, and I, I guess I'll step back a little bit, one of the things that um, the suspect, Franklin, was was known for was uh, being a bank robber, mm-hmm. and that's how he would bankroll um, getting around the country and everything. And they thought that once he knew that he was wanted, he would go, he would shy away from bank robberies because they're high profile and there's more security and and cameras and stuff and that he would try to find money in less criminal ways less like low um low risk ways Mm -hmm. and they knew that he was he had like they knew that i think they knew that he had given blood in the past right yes and they also predicted that he would go back down to the south where he was more familiar with the areas and that's exactly what he did Yep. So it, yeah, the the profile said, "Hey, this is probably what he's going to do," but then it just took the actual like kind of day to day police work to actually apprehend mm-hmm. the dude. Um, and and it happens pretty early into the book. That's one of the things that I was surprised yeah. about is like, me too. Him being caught was maybe less than a third of the way into the a book. Third, absolutely. I was going to say um, about a third of the way through. So. Um... Yep, and then we get to find out more about him, like his biography, basically. Yeah, and actually I found a quote. I I highlighted some stuff, um, and I found a quote that kind of goes along with um, you're saying how scary it is when you're, like, you're victimizing people based on something they have no control over. Um, Mm. So I'm going to read this really quick. Um, As horrible as urban gunmen like David Berkowitz, rapist killers like Ed Kemper and Richard Speck, and sadistic torture murderers like Lawrence Bittaker, Roy Norris, Leonard Lake, and Charles Eng are, there's no chance their perverse designs and deviant psyches are going to achieve larger social purchase and motivate others. We may have a fascination with them and what makes them tick, but their fascination is mixed with but that fascination is mixed with revulsion. With a Joseph Paul Franklin or a 22 caliber killer, which is another killer that was, was mentioned in the book. Um, though their venomous ideas and increasing victim count are not only imminent dangers in and of themselves, they are the embodiment of a philosophy that actually can draw in and inspire other weak disenfranchised losers. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I think that's one of the most important points of this entire book and why uh, I think it was probably important for um, these guys to write this story is the level of um, how they can inspire other people. Yep. Yeah. That you don't have to be, they're not like lightning in a bottle. Like it's something that can, mm-hmm. uh, it's more viral. It's more transmittable, I guess mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah. Um, right. And cause some of them are very specific in, in what they're, you know, like a Jeffrey Dahmer, he was specifically trying to create 
a lover, which was a zombie, because, but anyway, <laughs> that specific thing is not, um, you know, it was very, it's a particular quirk of Jeffrey Dahmer, but someone like Franklin, who is, and was very open about the fact that not only was he trying to eradicate other races, but also wanted to start a race war, like one of his idols, uh, Charles Manson, that has such a more dramatic impact on people continuing to enact that kind of, of crime again, much scarier, much, much more frightening. Yep. Yeah. And we can maybe make the quick um, segue into the whole Manson thing, because Manson is mentioned um, in as much as uh, he he was an inspiration for, for this dude, but also... Um, that he came up in conversation at one point with um, uh, between Douglas and, and Franklin mm -hmm. that, that he got, you know, that Douglas had an opportunity, had an opportunity to interview Manson. Um, and so like he got to see the reactions to um, how, how like Franklin's reactions to how Manson was as a person and all that nonsense. Um, but like I, the thing that I was thinking about, because I, like I said before, I read Helter Skelter um, and that's kind of my perspective on the whole Manson family thing. And from that, and like, you can correct me or give me an alternate take on this, um, the race war thing. And that's why I'm talking about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's to me, to my knowledge, Manson picked up the race war thing from someone else. Like it wasn't his yeah. original idea. And that was his way of just having something to, to control people with. Um, as opposed to like something that he like deeply believed in. <laughs> Absolutely. And that no, was 100% agree. Manson was just bitter about not becoming a famous musician. Right. And, and so his outlet was, I'm going to this, this was his like petty backlash against society. And he just framed it as a race war thing um, to control the people that he needed to. Um, and that was actually kind of, very briefly mentioned in this book where I think it was kind of an aside where he's like, I don't think he even ever cared about the race war. Um, yes, he absolutely that, did. That was important because I've heard people talk about Manson in the present day as if this guy was like super passionate about starting a race war. And that was his whole deal. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's what it was. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad yeah. that like, at least he weighed in, in a, as an aside about what he thinks was the real motivation for Manson. Absolutely. Yes. And again, plug for Mindhunter, that interview between Johnny Douglas um, and uh, Charles Manson is recreated um, in the, the fictional version in, in Mindhunter, the show. Yes. And tons of credit to uh, the actor who played Manson, who... Uh, oh. uh, Oh, I know him as Dewey Crow from Justified. I was going to say, all I, was, all I can think of is Justified. <laughs> uh, he is an amazing, he, he's an amazing actor, first of all. And um, I'm, I'm, this is me vamping while I look him up. Uh, Damon okay, Harriman. Damon Harriman um, did a great job uh, playing um, Manson in Mindhunter because it was just so like over the top and obvious. Mm -hmm. Um but then he also portrayed Manson in Once a Time Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or whatever, right? That yep. that Tarantino movie. Yes. It's good for him. He's real he's Manson typecast now. <laughs> so anyway, the Manson thing, the the Manson thing in here for me that I thought was important was like everybody pretty much knows that he was like a spineless piece of shit mm -hmm. and and really not that interesting. Even um Ed Kemper in the Mindhunter series was talking about why are you bothering with that guy. Um, right. And, uh, but because he held a specific ideal or at least pretended to, he inspired other people who absolutely did way worse shit. And that's really, really a problem. Absolutely. Yep. And that's, um, yeah, again, why I think this is such an important, uh, exploration. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess we could talk a little bit about, um, I have like a list of things that I thought might be interesting to talk about. And since we're kind of into the investigation part of it, mm -hmm. I thought maybe we could pause and talk about 
what created the Joseph Paul Franklin. Um, so like, obviously from what we've been, what we've learned over the years about, uh, people who are serial killers is that something caused it, something in their development kind of sent them on a path. And for, for this dude, both parents were crazy abusive. And, um, like the thing I like about this book is it goes into more specifics about like, um, motivating moments in their life that led to specific, um, behaviors later on. And so the big thing is he lost sight in one of his eyes as a child and through uh, mostly neglect because it seemed like it was something that was fixable, but he had shitty parents and that never got fixed. He lost sight in one of his eyes, which later led to the fact that he couldn't join the military or be a law enforcement officer. Um, and, and then he had basically a failure that he felt the need to compensate for. Absolutely. And uh, again, referring back to the the neglect uh, by his terrible parents, he was also, of course, physically abused, which is common in, um, or it can be a common history for um, serial killers, eventual serial killers. And he had that as well. So uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, and uh, feeling like he didn't get a fair you know, shot from the beginning and had to overcompensate for his place in the world ultimately. Yeah. Huge feelings of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and interestingly about when they were looking at his, his past and, and it's talked about very openly the, the importance of understanding a person's past and, and the, the usefulness of knowing the specific person that they're profiling versus knowing just the acts that they've done is that they can look at, the actual facts of this person's upbringing and use that to kind of profile instead of just kind of looking at what did they do to profile. Um, there was a cool uh, observation about, so this dude had, I think a brother and a couple sisters, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. the, the way that they came up differently um, and, and the profilers kind of perspective on, on women who went through certain, f- through similar circumstances tending to not become outwardly violent and instead Mm -hmm. like kind of internalizing like Mm self-hating and stuff like that was very interesting. Um, it was a cool perspective and it's not something that you expected from this book because it's absolutely focusing on a male serial killer, but, um, we got to see, um, their thoughts on why do women turn out differently than men? So that was cool. Yeah, no, there's a, there are a lot of uh, interesting, um, psychological insights, um, throughout this book on different things. Um, and of course, one of the things that, um, we haven't touched on, but probably cause it's, it's painfully obvious from the synopsis, but the things that he got heavily involved in after probably his teenage years, I think, were of course, Nazism and the KKK. Yeah. So, um, which is also kind of common for you know, and I, which I don't know if we really touched on this, but the um, he was raised in in poverty too, of course, and um, being aimless, not being able to join the military, not being able to pursue law enforcement. He was kind of aimless and something that has structure, like those types of organizations, um, especially with their kind of militarism that they they gravitate towards as well was a perfect avenue for someone like Franklin to join in and become, uh, make it part of, uh, the mission of his life of how to live. Yeah. And ra- being raised in Alab- mobile, Am- mobile, Alabama, Al- mm. fuck, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> yeah. And being raised in mobile, Am- mobile, I can't fucking say the word, right? Whatever. Mobile, Am- Alabama. Is that? Is yeah. yeah. Mobile. But no, exactly. I think uh, the Deep South uh, being raised there was certainly uh, something that had an impact. Did he also mention, I think, was he re- was um, was that part of the biography that the area he lived in was primarily a black community? I don't re- I don't recall, but OK, um... that might have been something else that I was reading about somebody else. My my apologies. But uh, I mean, that is an area that. um that at the very least was one of the last segregated 
And so yeah. around that time period when we're just coming out of the 1960s, um, and into the 70s, that would have been a very tumultuous area to grow up in and an easy um, area for a, a white, poor people in those types of communities to um, buy into that kind of racial um, hatred. Yeah. Yeah. So and um, I like the fact that in the book, the authors also explore um, the thought of had this person lived in a different area of the country or had they had like mildly different um, circumstances, would they have turned out differently? And obviously the speculation is that, yeah, probably that, that, that could have, that was a factor, but um, is what it is. But also that um, I think the brother Franklin's brother had um some like kind of minor crimes and stuff that they'd committed over the years but didn't end up also being a fucking crazy serial killer <laughs> <laughs> no um but maybe it's because he kept both eyes <laughs> that you know what that you know and that's like that could be an inciting factor i guess but um eyesight who knew it was going to be such a big deal mm-hmm. um but the majority of the book does cover um, post, um, post arrest, um, trial time. And also like, uh, his years in jail. And, and if you break it down, I think that from the time the dude was arrested till the time he died, he spent more time in jail than out of jail. Um, yes. and, and a lot of the book covers, um, how once he's apprehended, that doesn't mean that the investigation was over because, um, there was the crimes that were known about, but there was the, there was the burden of having to prove that he did them. Um, and then also like revealing crimes that he, he had not been associated with yet. Right No, And that's another thing that is, um, it's procedural about the book, but, and, and I say that as a, uh, as a, um, a positive, they do a good job of showing that the, not only does, a profiler or an investigator have to deal with hunting down the criminal. But once they're arrested, the actual prosecution and going through the justice system becomes a whole nother animal of trying to get justice for these victims and their families. And within the justice system, it's not just the lawyers and the judge and the jury in the courtroom. There are inevitably politics that get involved, especially when you have someone who has murdered people across the country. So you have state level trials that are go on, going on, you have federal level trials that are going on, these all cost money, they are all, and so just the drama and the complications of what it means to try and bring someone to justice for such horrid crimes that you know they have committed but you may not have the hard evidence to convict them. Uh, it was, uh, they do a really good job of, of highlighting those struggles. Yeah. And especially complicated by the fact that this person for the most, for the majority of, of the crimes that he was tried for was someone who killed at a distance. So mm -hmm. the, the possibility of finding, um, and he was super careful, like, it, like regardless of whether he was smart or not, the man knew, he was organized and um, careful about um, not getting caught, which is not Definitely. always not always typical of, of serial killers um, or maybe even, I think, assassins. I don't know. Um, it, you know, it, it's a blur. Well, actually, and I think that was a good I, I love the way you set that up, because I think that is the difference. Um, or if you want to categorize the type of serial killer he is, he was an assassin. Yeah. One of the points they make about him is he was very mission oriented. He um, and when it comes to assassins, they uh, he I think highlighted the difference between someone like Franklin and a a terrorist who is willing to wear a suicide bomb. Yeah. Uh, because they are their ultimate goal is not just the attack but also martyrdom. And he was not, Franklin was not interested in being a martyr. He was just interested in the mission. So he would set up so that he could get in and out and accomplish his goal. Once it was done, 
he may not have even known who he killed. He yeah. didn't care. It was a matter of how many people can I kill and move on to the next target. Um, so he is a true assassin in that he was just concerned about body count. Yeah, and that makes it like like levels of magnitude more scary because mm -hmm. um, like basically as opposed to like if I'm a serial killer and I need to find like a certain like you know a woman who looks a certain way is a certain age is a certain like body type or whatever um, mm -hmm. then I also need to find a circumstance in where I can do something to that person whereas like if I'm an assassin who doesn't care who I kill as long as I kill like the opportunity presents itself almost constantly. So that's, that's exactly, that's really freaky. Um, but like, again, it makes it so that it's much more difficult to prove something after the fact and their, their cases relied heavily on witnesses, but not witnesses to crimes, but witnesses to people hearing this dude talk about shit after the fact. <laughs> yes. And then thankfully it's, or I say, thankfully, um, however that, sounds at the end of the sentence um <laughs> he towards the end of his prison sentences um he was willing to take credit for more and more of his murders and confess to them because he realized the only thing he ultimately had was the notoriety and to be able to take credit for as many as possible otherwise they may not have had the physical evidence to tie him to the many murders that he committed. Yeah, and and there's and it's there's like a there's almost a palpable moment where like it seems like he shifts um his attitude about things like uh, the first time he's convicted he gets two life sentences. Um and then, you know, starts his his prison sentence and then time goes on and they start, you know, try you know, trying him for other crimes, but after those first two life sentences where this dude knows I'm going to be in here for a while. Mm -hmm. He knows he's caught. So it's not like a, I'm going to get away and do more of this. Now it's like he shifted to, um, I'm taking credit for like the awesomeness of the thing that I did. Um, so it was yes, interesting and to he see wanted to move prisons because being a racist and a <laughs> general population of a mostly black prison, uh, became a bit of a, <laughs> Um, Problem. Uh, a bad situation, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a deadly situation for him. <laughs> yeah, so then it becomes something entirely different. Like when he was out there for several years, just killing people and and discovering that he could figure out ways to get away with it. You know, it was all about like let's maximize the damage. But once he was behind bars, and it seemed like that that wasn't going to be changing anytime soon. Then it became, let's just set the record straight about the chaos I created. Mm-hmm. Very much so. And uh, honestly, like, this wasn't a huge part of the book, but it came up a couple of times, and it was uh, illuminating for me. He was, for most of the book, uh, you know, from the beginning of when it hits the timeline, suspected to be the person who shot uh, and, and paralyzed Larry Flint, who is the Hustler Magazine dude. Um, and I watched The People vs. Larry Flint, and I thought it was a very good movie. Um, yeah. And so, like, I saw all that go down, but I had I, I, I had no idea. I, I never even thought to think about who tr who tried to kill the dude. And then, so when it came up in this book, it was, it was neat to see, like, that that get expanded on a little. Yes, it was a, it was a surprise for me. I did not know that, uh, going into it, that this was the guy who shot and paralyzed Larry Flint at all. And I thought it was very interesting that, you know, Larry Flint, I think most of us just associate porn with him. But for Franklin, it was the fact that there were uh, bi biracial couples um, that he was against, um, of course, mixing of races. And so that's what infuriated him and why he wanted to take Larry Flint out. Yeah. And I knew that, uh, and it's probably from the movie people versus Larry Flint maybe, or maybe it's just like random knowledge I picked up throughout life. But like, I knew that hustler was the first porn to, to depict like interracial 
sexy things happening. Um, <laughs> and I knew that there was a lot of controversy for it, but um, I never connected the dots that, you know, it was a high profile or kill, high profile killer who would have been involved. Um, but yeah, that was interesting. And, and then, um, uh, it was because then, then it, it, they dipped really briefly into like Larry Flint and, um, legal things around that. But just like, like it was a nice little glimpse into how crazy and fucking weird Larry Flint was because I think at some point they talked about him threatening to kill a president or something. And it's like, <laughs> well, he's not a likable dude. So <laughs> it's yeah. just like a funny aside. <laughs> Larry Flint. But anyway, that that's honestly we've looked at a like a good chunk of the stuff that's discussed in the book. Um but the overall idea was this guy was killing either African Americans, mixed race couples, or Jews. And I think the other the other example of killing a Jewish trying to kill a Jewish person was when he was going to bomb that judge's house. Mm-hmm. In Wisconsin, I think that was the other Jewish person that was that. Was, oh, and, oh, yeah, yes. yeah. It sets up the types of crimes that he was doing, and then um, just the. I, I thought that the the criminal um, trials were interesting too, to see what worked and what didn't, and how much it hinged on um, jail rats and stuff like that. Like, oh yes, like people ratting out or just like, but then like they're inherently criminal um criminal testimony is inherently um yeah thank you because they have a they're criminals so they're not (laughs) trustworthy from the beginning and b they have a vested interest possibly in um, giving information to exchange for whatever in in jail so that was interesting i thought so too yep and that's, um, he does, I wish I had highlighted this and I was looking for it in the things I highlighted. Um, but he does at one point kind of lay out uh, a list of things that can get in the way of, um, of a good conviction. And uh, definitely the um, criminal uh, witness testimony is, is one of the issues. Um, and I can't remember the rest, but. Anyway, mm-hmm. they again, they do a really good job of, of talking about every element of investigation and conviction. It's very well done. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk about how like this, the book wraps up and um, and kind of the the way that the authors tied it into what's happening in the present day. But I just I found a quote that I thought was interesting. And in the process of um, I think this was in the process of appealing um, the death penalty Mm -hmm. Uh, because he had at one point kind of had a change of heart about being okay with being executed. Obviously, like the closer you get to your actual death penalty, the less you're, you're interested in that idea. Um, Mm -hmm. there's a quote from a defense attorney appealing to people, um, that he shouldn't be, that Franklin shouldn't be killed. And so there's the quote and then there's, um, Douglas's response to it and um I I thought that this is like super super pertinent so this is the quote Joseph Paul Franklin is an intelligent religious humorous useful human being and given the chance by you I'm sure he could make a contribution to the world this country this society the defendant has enriched my life I'm sure he could do it for another and then the response is, huh, intelligent, religious, humorous, useful. <laughs> Are we talking about the same Joseph Paul Franklin? I guess mm-hmm. he was intelligent in that he was able to kill people and rob banks without getting caught for several years. Perhaps you could say he was religious and that he thought Jesus Christ supported his deadly mission. If you call laughing at the killing of African-Americans humorous, I suppose you could check that one off. And if you wished to see Adolf Hitler's vision finally carried out in 1980s America, he was useful. But that's not how I would ever construe those terms. Oh, and just for the record, so far as I know, Franklin never did enrich anyone else's life, though he sure ended enough of them. Yeah. It's fucking, can you imagine being the defense attorney that wrote that? So I always get curious about those. Um, And by the way, I did find the quote finally. Um, So let me say that, and then I'm going to go back to what um, Mm -hmm. defense attorneys. Uh, Brandon Garrett 
a distinguished law professor and author, now at Duke, Univer Duke University School of Law, names it as one of the five common reasons for wrongful convictions. And those five are false confessions, junk science, ineffective counsel, and bad judging. That's all. Yeah, one, two, three. That was four. But anyway, um, yeah, I always get grossed out is probably the term I'm going to use for people who represent people like Franklin or just a known, you know, uh, Scott Peterson, um, just anyone that we already <laughs> know is, is uh, guilty of something heinous. And I do realize that, you know, part of our uh, judicial system or ideology is that everyone has a right to counsel. And I don't want to, um, to disagree with that as, as an idea, but when you go that far to talk about someone and, and misconstrue who they are as a human being and, mm. and what their motivations were, what their, uh, what their crimes were, um, then, then I take an issue with that. Exactly. Because like at this point, the dude, at the point that that quote that I just read was made, he had confessed to killing tons of people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he had basically outright said, I don't know why it's not legal to kill Jews like mm -hmm. like that obvious and like was a proud racist. And um, it, it's not like he was um, mysterious in any way. Like this dude was black no. and white about not pardon the, the, the term, but like he was very black and white on what he believed <laughs> and what his goals were. So to be characterized like that. That's a problem. Like if you have an attorney that's like, oh, because of X, Y, and Z medical factors, it's not um, humane to do X, Y, and Z. Sure. I get that. Like make sure that there's not cruel and unusual like circumstances to someone's prison sentence. But don't pull this bullshit. Like, come on. Exactly. Exactly. A duck is a duck. Duck is a duck. That guy, huge He's duck. A duck. <laughs> Is a huge duck. <laughs> yep. uh, so um, the uh, the story wraps up that he was executed finally in um, 2013 after being like, "Hey, I've turned into a new person, and I don't care about killing blacks and Jews anymore." So yeah, you know, allegedly. please don't. Um, yeah, evidently he wasn't a racist at the end of his <laughs> life. As if that should excuse mm -hmm. any any of it. Like, uh, so he's executed. And it really wasn't actual remorse. Right. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, you know what, though? I just remembered. Um, there. So I, I feel like the authors do a great job of not humanizing this dude in any way uh, throughout the book. That's Un fair. Except for at the toward the end when they're talking about, like, you know, leading up to his execution in the later years, like in the, in the early two thousands, I believe, um, Franklin reached out to Douglas, um, asking to find his first wife yes. or the mother of his child, basically. Yeah. Um, and there, it was like the most pathetic kind of, you could tell this guy had a very empty life mm -hmm. and it was only this late in life that he realized that he possibly realized that, um, you know, people can mean things to each other like that kind of a thing Absolutely. and so it was this very pathetic like attempt for him to to reconnect with his his family um toward the end that was um it was kind of like the perfect um humanizing of the person because it made it emphasized the fact that like um the choices this person made to go down the dark path they did took away their option to have a normal happy life absolutely so there's that yep. no one wins in this and, story. and i love it when criminals are depicted as being losers or hopeless or you know like the shitty people that they are instead of glorified exactly um and so this book does a great job of really realistically depicting the piece of garbage that this person is and not making them like some sort of like cult icon for some reason. Yes. And I think they do it in a way too, that again is very clinical 
they simply lay out, you know, crimes, how he committed them, things he said. They would quote him. They discuss. So all of it was very factual uh, about, like, just kind of setting up exactly what they encountered as investigators, so that we, as the reader, can make our draw our own conclusions or opinions about um, about this gentleman. And you're exactly right. I don't think there's anyone that can come away from this read and think, oh, this guy was really cool. He was committed to his mission. He's not cool. And, and it's almost like you set up the epilogue of the book perfectly <laughs> <laughs> because um, there is, a, um, and I'm sure you have thoughts on it, but um, there is, there's kind of an epilogue to, there. I, I don't know. Is an actual epilogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's called epilogue. Yep. It's called epilogue. Um, <laughs> that's the thing at the end, Rob. And <laughs> so uh, they go into the authors go into, and it, it, I say the authors because I don't want to um, people to forget that it is co-authored, yeah. but um, it is from the perspective of um, Douglas. So, um, but like the end of the epilogue basically goes into talking about the importance of understanding people like this person because of the um, impact they can have on other people. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and obviously it ties in very strongly to some of the stuff that's going on today. Absolutely. And of course the book is called Killer Shadow, which I think is ultimately the point is someone like this can inspire people for decades to come. And we are currently in a very similar uh, cultural divide or, um, you know, cultural war is what they're calling it right before an election. Um, and, um, we have a, not to, you know, get too political about it, but we do have a president who doesn't seem to want to condemn violence, um, between different groups. And so it becomes a potential breeding ground for, people like Franklin to, uh, to become uh, active again. And um, one of the quotes that um, I've got a couple, one is directly from the epilogue, um, and I, it may even be the last line, but thoughts and words matter. They have power for both good and evil. They inspire some to violence, and those in turn inspire others. And so, you know, Franklin, who was inspired by things like Mein Kampf um, and any other of the, the propaganda from the KKK and, and whatever groups he was, was a part of, I mean, even Hustler, he would get um, riled up by looking at the interracial couples. So, um, which I'm not saying that is bad, but because he was reading things that confirmed and allowed him to internalize this in insane belief that is scientifically disproven for those that still believe in science. Um, there's no difference, uh, (laughs) between, um, people with different colored skin. So, um, anyway, it's just, I, I appreciate the, um, them bringing it back home and it was a great full circle moment coming from setting up the culture, uh, going into the seventies. And then here we are now, um, after the 2016 election going into the 2020 election and, and what are we looking, looking at in the future? Yeah. And, and some of the like creepier shit that has to do with like that words have impact thing, um, somewhere along the lines, uh, it was after he was, uh, caught, and like it was during the kind of trial part of the book, they talk about a book that was written called Hunter, um, yes. which is uh, basically a fictionalization of of this dude's life. Where um, yes. I'm going to read it. It follow. I don't even want to give like I don't even want to give attention to this fucking book. But like a person wants to assassinate interracial couples um, and civil rights advocates and settle the Jewish question. Um, and it's like, so someone saw the news about this fucking dude who was killing people and was Mm -hmm. like, I'm going to, um, I'm going to make this book about this person. And then people read it. Make him a hero. Yeah. People read it, were inspired by it, all that kind of shit. And it's so like, uh, it just gives me the creeps. And, and I know that type of stuff is happening now. I can't remember 
there's like with all the QAnon stuff and everything that's going on, um, yes. I know that there's literature um, that people are looking out, seeking out um, as a way to like reinforce their dumbass beliefs about stuff. Um, so yeah, and, yeah, it's creepy. And he, the other quote that is actually from more of the middle of the book, but I think it does a great job explaining why sometimes having conversations with these types of ideologies becomes so difficult. It's a little bit long, but it's got some really good stuff in it. Mm. Um, and it was, um, he's describing, um, basically Franklin talking about, um, his beliefs, um, as he had in his previous interviews with law enforcement, he described the details of hateful beliefs, and it was clear that we weren't going to change his thinking any more than he was going to change ours. This paranoid, delusional system he subscribed to, in which Jews nefariously controlled all the mechanisms of government and commerce, and blacks were their ignorant pawns and somewhat less than fully human, appeared logical to him within his own value structure, and he was not about to break out of it. With someone like this, the more you try to convince them of the actual illogic of their thinking, the more attenuated and disjointed their argument may become. But they will hold fast to their ideas because to change their thinking would mean to have to acknowledge that their own inadequacy. In fact, Franklin likened his three-year run of murders before his arrest to Christ's three-year ministry before his arrest and, and crucifixion, a comparison he would make to others. He firmly, firmly believed he was doing the will of God and justified his goal by saying that if the Lord had wanted all peoples to mix, he would have created only one race. Um, I think there are a lot of illogic, uh, illogical arguments happening, um, on especially social media, constantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, another reason I think the timeliness of this book is so important is how you can mix up religion into these types of ideologies and how it really encourages people to internalize and, and hold fast to something and, and you not be able to break through. Um, it's just, it's a very dangerous combination. Yeah. That's, that's some like, and the, the, the non-racist example that comes readily to mind for me is flat earthers. Um, <laughs> because they're, they're, you know, they've, they've kind of, you know, been more common recently, but the existence of YouTube makes it so that people can just kind of put up their dumb ass beliefs and, um, y arguing with someone who's a flat earther really like they dig in like a tick, like it makes them more, <laughs> um, like passionate about proving their point instead of just seeing reason and, and, um, yeah, there's a logical, there's a specific logical fallacy about like what, Absolutely. what he was mentioning, but, um, it, but that brings up the, so I saw someone today, I saw, I read an article today about, um, I think it was called like, I lost, I lost my best friend to QAnon. Oh dear. And, um, the whole idea was that this person who, uh, it was a female, it was an author, the author of the article was female and there was a female mm -hmm. friend. And, um, not that it matters, but I just, if I say her, <laughs> that's why I'm setting the it up. The use of pronouns. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, they were, they were best friends, I guess. And, um, at some point the, the one friend discovered QAnon and started talking about it. Like, you know, it came up occasionally or whatever, but then it became more insistent and more frantic and over time, like it got to the point where like at a party, the QAnon friend was like ranting for like 45 minutes drunkenly about the most QAnon nonsense possible. And they had to be asked to leave and like got blocked on social media and everything. And it's just like, that's not something that we've traditionally experienced, I guess, uh, I guess from my generation, at least um, to the extremity that it's happening right now. But um, like you're saying, the poignancy of this book is, um, is it's it's super important right now for people to understand that like people can be I'm going to use a word loosely radicalized um, to ideas, and the climate of our world right now is just pushing two sides farther apart. Definitely. Um, 
and it's it's not a harmless thing exactly exactly it's not at all and i think one of the most troubling things becomes uh it's almost as if on both sides too and i know we're really more talking about one but i want to just make it as uh moderate as possible to not alienate anybody i think both sides that are on extremes like to make it out as if each side is extreme as a whole. And that's not the case. I think there are more people in the middle than we realize, but all that we see and hear and read is the extremism, which is so dangerous for people like Franklin who can be easily triggered and think this is their opportunity to you know, carry out some mission or other because the sanctity of their country is at stake or the, you know, the whatever of their country, make America great again. So. Yeah. And that's you, you really nailed the message that I try to keep in my head is that we're basically given a two option situation for most like social things that are going on. It's either mm-hmm. like the Democrat side of things or the Republican side of things. And I honestly don't believe that either if we're going to stick to like a party, uh, you know, um, example, I don't think either one accurately represents the people that prescribe to them. Um, 100. Me, like we're all like you said, we're all pretty in the middle about shit. Like and if you boil it down, like if you take politics out of any individual discussion, like yeah. if you said, hey, what do you feel about? random people killing other random people, most of us are going to kind of feel the same way. <laughs> yes. Except for this fucking Franklin idiot. Um, and so, yeah, the, the narrative that we, the narrative that we have right now is the trap that we fall into. And as much as we're being tricked into not representing what we actually believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And I, I think to, um, which I'm probably going too far on on a point that I wasn't going to make. But I think when you have leaders who are not willing to condemn violence, that uh, especially uh, becomes, um, um, I can't even think of the right word anymore, but that's uh, what's frightening about our our current, or going into our, our, uh, our current election. Yeah. Because and and that goes back to the the when you said um, words have both power and consequences I think right yeah. um, that that goes like especially so in a social media heavy world um, what one person says can have immediate and disastrous effects um, regardless of whether they intended that to happen or not so there's a responsibility for anybody of celebrity or, um, in a seat of power to, yeah. And influence. Absolutely. And we're not seeing that we're seeing kind of the exact opposite of that. And it's really fucking frightening. Um, and obviously like, so we're recording this on November 1st. So (laughs) two days from now, we are going to have an idea at least of what four years of, of this shit is going to be like, but it's nothing's going to change immediately. Um, right. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, uh, we were talking about before, uh, we started recording and that I think has made me a little more sensitive about, especially, uh, the comments in the epilogue of this book, uh, is that this weekend, uh, in the state of Texas, Uh, It appears, I know it's being investigated, but it appears that a train of uh, truck enthusiasts, uh, uh, I guess, um, boxed in a uh, Biden-Harris bus and rammed into them, basically created an extremely dangerous situation on an interstate. And um, I just don't understand uh, how there can be so many people who think that that's an acceptable way to conduct themselves in a society. Um, where are we at and why hasn't, why hadn't the leaders 
uh, condemned it the way that they sh they should, or the way I think that they should. So it's it's ultra concerning that that's the environment that we're in, um, because that just encourages again people who have the kinds of mission minded um, qualities of someone like Franklin, and why I think it's it's important that we pay attention to this this type of story right now. Yeah. Yep. I I fully agree. It's fucking awful and despicable. Um, and yeah. Um, and it's not something that like, you know, we're going to solve on, on this podcast, but, um, <laughs> no. uh, understanding and, and even like having the, even taking the initiative to just try and understand things like that better. Like reading this book, was illuminated many things for me and especially the um um like the type of person that the the that the bad guy is in this book the criminal is in this book is like um he this is going to be i'm going to be as as topical and as and as modern as possible with this he's the gender reveal party in the national forest <laughs> Regardless of <laughs> regardless of that person's individual actions, and it could be this criminal, it could be the person that's irresponsibly t tweeting shit that I constantly report to Twitter and nobody does anything about, um, mm -hmm. they are the gender reveal party that wipes out thousands of acres of nature. And people need to be held responsible for the the impact of, of their actions, I guess. Anyway, we should lighten it up a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And I, I, I took us down. I was ready. State of Texas. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you're the one that represents that state right now. So I feel I bad do. for you. Thanks. Um, I am going to lighten it up with something. It's an observation that I made that I don't think, I, I don't think, I don't think I would have noticed if it didn't happen multiple times throughout the book, but so um, like this, like we've, we, we kind of mentioned like the book basically takes place between the late seventies and the mid eighties, as far as like when the crimes are happening. And then it kind of leads into like the two thousands and stuff. But the bulk of, of the stuff that we're being to told is like late seventies to mid eighties. And one thing that came up multiple times, which really kind of, you know, raised my eyebrow a bit was like how young the girls were in some of these relationships, <laughs> Like, mm. did that, did you notice that? Cause there was one where like, <laughs> um, I remember, I remember, I don't remember the specifics, but like there was one where a girl was like 16 and the guy she was dating was like 22. Yes. And I was like, okay, that's fucked up. But then they were like, they'd begin to get been together for three years. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so that makes them 13 and 19 yeah um i did pick up on that i'd forgotten about it so you mentioned it again <laughs> uh it's a little frightening i um and they didn't spend any time discussing that either <laughs> no that was just a fact from it yeah. was like that was the number on the sheet from the from the like the case case file <laughs> and but like it happened another time because franklin himself i believe had a young wife yes 16 yeah she was 16 and i'm like so part of me is like were they just really cool with shit back then but like i think the real like the reality is um it was probably there was much more of a small town mentality back then where it's like well who else is he gonna date i was gonna say that also i may or may not have recently watched a program about child brides and that being a, a whole other epidemic um <laughs> in the united states but we don't want to go down that that uh, rabbit hole today yeah, yeah it's that's a whole weird that just and the and the thing i think the reason that stood out for me was that wasn't even one of the problems in the exactly. story like it was just exactly. like i said before numbers on a that's page that's just so. a matter of fact yes yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's just where we're at so yeah um we we should probably do a quick wrap up and uh, throw oh, a rating sure. on the book. Um, so, are you prepared, or should I go first? Um, I am prepared. Okay, go for it. I will absolutely go first. I I think I've said this a couple of times already, but I was impressed with 
um, how the, uh, they outlined everything in the book, how it was constructed. It was procedural, but that's exactly what I would expect from an investigator um, and, uh, and Mark as well, Ol Shaker, because I've, I've read Mindhunter and uh, I know, know what to expect. Um, as far as, uh, I guess, excitement um, or anything else you might look for in a book, I, uh, again, it was, it was so clinical. It was very interesting, but I don't know that it's something that's going to uh, keep you up at night in an exciting way necessarily. It's pretty terrifying um, and matter of fact, but very poignant and um, will probably teach you some things that um, are good to know as far as if you're interested in criminal profiling or any of that type of psychology, if you're interested in the criminal justice system, how crimes are investigated, how they were investigated, how far we've come. Um, it's uh, very educational um, and very, very well done. So overall, uh, my, uh, I rated it as an 8.57. All right. Um, <clears throat> I will be honest, I had entirely forgotten to um, do my normal rating scale until Missy mentioned that she had a rating. And so I kind of did this after the fact, but um, I'm going to agree with Missy. One of the things about this book that I thought was um, uh, kind of like the main characteristic of it was, um, I think you said clinical. And, and for me, it was definitely kind of like an autopsy. There was a specific approach that they took to analyzing the information. But the thing I thought was great about it was um, they absolutely took time to explain why it mattered. And mm. that was a huge part of what I thought made the book so interesting was it wasn't just saying this happened because of this, ha this caused this to happen. Um, they talked about why that was important for the investigation and for, um, you know, the, the future of understanding criminals and stopping crimes and stuff. So uh, that was probably what I thought was one of the best things about the book was why, why is this important to the, the information that we're sharing with you? Um, and then obviously like we really enjoyed the epilogue of it because um, like Misty said, there's a, there's probably a reason this book is released now. Um, because it's necessary for people to understand again, why things are happening, um, the way they are. And this is a great way to get some perspective on what causes someone to act like a crazy fucked up racist serial killer. Um, <laughs> so it's very nice that, that it's nice that the book came out when it did. Um, but it's also nice that they were careful to not glorify the bad stuff. And I want to say, um, I didn't notice until I went back into the book later, but their dedication at the beginning of the book is to all the victims. So I didn't even notice that until like when I started the book and I'm actually oh. going to open it up right now. Um, because in addition to, to dedicating it to the individual victims, I feel like there's some nice words that I totally forgot. So, um, may their memory be a blessing and a triumph of love over hate. So it's obvious that there was a, a very specific reason that they thought it was important to make this book available and to make the story available and their perspectives about this particular awful piece of shit. And um, it's that spirit of, of why they did this that I think made it um, as good as it was and, and as good of a read as it was. So uh, my rating overall Nine out of ten. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And so, um, in it's speaking in general, um, I don't get to do nonfiction often, but one of the things that stood out was um, the way this was narr narrated, written. The narration of it was bit from the perspective of Douglas, um, talking about like in the in the past tense, like what he did. And, and all that kind of thing. So it was much more of a conversational thing, but it did have that heavily, like, like Missy said, clinical, um, fact-based procedural, um, feel to it. Um, but it's, it's still pretty dry. Yeah. But, um, mixed in with like 
there was purpose and it's the purpose that they worked into it that I feel like makes it easier to read and makes it compels you to continue reading. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very excited that you brought that, brought up that point because they did an excellent job of, of explaining why each of the pieces were important. Just like you said. Yeah, for sure. So that <laughs> that's a book. We, we reviewed a book without Livius. Oh, we did. He's probably in, enjoying himself though. Let's hope so. Um, I hadn't really prepared any other conversation um, outside of this. Usually we have like a little bit of banter, like when we do book reviews and stuff. Um, everybody knows that me and Misty have both watched the Mindhunter series and really enjoyed it. Um, but like otherwise, do you have some general true crime stuff you'd like to like say, hey, if you enjoyed this type of true crime stuff, this, you know, reading this killer shadow book might appeal to you? Or is it kind of like all or nothing? Um, well, I w- actually, I'm glad you asked that. So I think the only distinction I wanted to make about this book versus other ones is, um, you know, something like Anne Rules, A Stranger Beside Me, like I mentioned before, or Michelle McNamara's. They were very personal um, and emotional um, uh, pieces to it as well. And that was the only thing different about this book. This is definitely an educational book, not really, or not simply a story. Like, I feel like some other ones are like stories, if that makes sense. Um, So I think knowing that going in, if you've read a Douglas book before, it's it's an Old Shaker book before, they're uh, very similar. So you're going to get exactly what you're looking for. Um, and I think what's really cool for, cool for that too, because, you know, he mentions that part of what they created with that psychologist who I assume is, um, who, oh my goodness, what is her name? Anna Olivia. Torf. From, yes. Anna Torv plays in Mind Hunter. They mentioned the psychologist who helps them right. create the, the interview outline. And then ultimately they create that criminal, some, like CCM, I think, which is very similar to the American Psychology's uh, DSM. Right. For criminal um, profiling of some kind. So anyway, I think this book acts similar to other true nonfiction things that Douglas has been involved in, and in that it's for law enforcement as much as it is for just general public read. Like this can absolutely help armchair detectives, anybody who um, participates in uh, true crime communities to help solve crimes. I think this is a super helpful uh, read for for people like them. I was just reminded of so um, it really like it bothers me when like real awful, terrible people at one point wanted to be cops. (laughs) <laughs> or were or were cops, especially yeah. like in like the current climate, you know, of of police just f- completely failing to have their shit together about pretty much anything. Um, and so I was thinking about how like uh, Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden yes. State Killer, was a police officer. Yep. Uh, this dude Franklin wanted to be a cop before he got disqualified for, you know, you know, not having his. Uh, eyesight and one eye I, mm-hmm. and then that led me down a mental path to um the discussion in hannibal with um <laughs> uh <gasps> where they're talking about psychopaths and like the top professions yes. for psychopaths <laughs> and yeah. then so like i was like i took that it took that thing that it, like fucking bugs me about like uh law enforcement in general it, like that like you know it's almost like a, it, it takes one to catch one personality Yes, um, yes, and definitely. turned it into a fun memory of of Hannibal and a bunch of psychopaths talking about like pointing psychopath fingers at each other. <laughs> they are. <laughs> they are. All right, uh, we are wrapping up this episode because um, not long from now, we actually tomorrow uh, we we're recording an interview with Mark Olshaker, uh, one of the authors of this book, and so we have more work ahead of us, but. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Misty, for for joining and doing the the review with me. It was wonderful. I honestly, at one point, was thinking like, I wonder how long we're going to get out of this. And it's a huge episode, so um, I think that 
you know, kind of says that it worked out very well. Well, thank you. I take that as a huge compliment. Hope that doesn't frighten Livius about, um, you know, his <laughs> role here on Booked. We're just gonna we're gonna do regular um, true crime reviews now. It'll like any, when when a good one pops up, we'll just do it, and that'll be our thing. Oh my goodness! Please, that would be awesome. I'm <laughs> I'm in. Um, all right, so join us a week from this episode where you'll hear me and Misty talking to Mark Olshaker about that's going to be an interesting one because we get to talk about this book, but like the dude co-wrote several books with, um, uh, you know, John Douglas. Mm -hmm. He also has worked on, you know, other topics like, um, pandemics and stuff. So it's like, I couldn't think of a better time to get this dude on the podcast and talk to him. So I'm very excited about that. Same. Same. All <laughs> right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Join us next time. Until then, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Misty Bennett. Keep reading. <laughs>